In order to explain and to prove this case about the studies on what they've discovered or what I've also discovered through the Word of God, we're going to see that there are what's a really sad case and might be a shocking case is that two billion Christians actually embrace demons. Now, the reason why is as follows. We're going to look at several passages to explain this. First of all, we have to realize who the majority of the world belongs to. Right. So look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Turn to your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Who does the majority of the world belong to? We have to realize that the majority population, mm -hmm. see that? That way you won't be shocked about the numbers. You might think that that's pretty shocking, but if you know what your Bible actually says, and we have to study the Bible, right? Yeah. right. The main study we're going to use to uh, see this is definitely going to be the Word of God. Okay. And the Bible is going to plainly show you. Now, majority of population is actually run, run by Satan. Yep. If you believe in that, then the rest is not going to be difficult for you to understand. All right, we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and then we'll look at verse 4. The Bible says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So notice right here that there is the God of this world. And that's referring to Satan. He's the one in charge of making sure people get blinded in the world. Another passage to look at is the book of Luke. Look at the book of Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Majority percentage of the populace will be controlled by Satan and they will embrace Satan. Look at Luke chapter 4. The Bible shows where Satan explains, I am the one in charge of everything of the kingdoms of this world. He says in verse 5, and the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed him unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. You see that? Yeah. The Bible says, And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. Notice that he says that all the kingdoms of this world belong to him. So, Observing these two passages, it shouldn't be a surprise to you. Majority of the population in this world will be controlled by Satan, and he runs the show. Right. Now, how is it that it will be two billion Christians? Because that's what studies claim as Christians. So we're going to look at what the studies show on what Christianity is. And the world's perception of Christianity is pretty messed up. Now they've uh, discovered or they've view Christianity as basically a general term for anybody who uh, sees or views themselves as a Christian. Doctrine is not a big deal to people. You got to realize that just because a person is dubbed Christian does not mean automatically that he's a Christian. Right, man. That's right. So if they think that they are called Christians, then we're going to go by their terms. We're going to go by their terms, and what you're going to find out is that Two billion Christians are going to be, at the very least, the ones that embrace Satan. Yep. Now, the two billion Christians, is this is shown from the Pew Research Center. The title of the article is Global Christianity, a report on the size and distribution of the world's Christian population. And they calculated all, they calculated everything about uh, the Christian religions and the areas that Christianity is supposedly at, they mainly divided things to, uh, there are three main groups that they dubbed it as Catholicism and then also the Orthodox religion and Protestantism. Those are the three main groups. And then the fourth one is other. So those can include Jehovah Witnesses, Mormonism, etc., 
when we see these uh, Christian denominations, so notice that Protestantism, just because you're a Protestant doesn't mean you're right then. But uh, let's see if that's the case or not. Point is that the Christian populace and the percentage is included in this. And they point out over here in this article that the very least that we're going to come down to is 2 billion. We're going to say safely that 2 billion is going to be the number. Catholicism is 50.1%. Protestantism is 36.7%. And then other Christian will be 1.3%. Orthodox is 11.9%. They say right here, the number of Christians around the world has nearly quadrupled in the last 100 years from about 600 million in 1910 to more than 2 billion in 2010. Okay, so then what that means is it's going to be higher than 2 billion. It's going to be higher than 2 billion. So I'm not just giving a title that's uh, like a half truth or something like that. If we take this into account that this is going to be about 2 billion Christians, and we're going to safely put at that number, well, obviously, I'm a Christian too, right? So then which amount of Christians, which percentage of Christians would we say is going to be uh, pretty much a safe number, right? How much is deceived by Satan? How much is not deceived by Satan? Because I can't simply just say that 2 billion Christians are right with God, obviously. Right. So obviously, there's going to be a number that's going to be deceived by Satan and then a number that's not deceived by Satan. Where my position is, and we're going to explain all of that, how you can tell a person's position is by their beliefs, obviously. And it's an ugly word, but it's called doctrine. Now, people say, what's the big deal about doctrine? You should make a big deal about doctrine. It clarifies your position of Christianity. Yep. And it shows us what kind of Christian you are. Right. Now, look at Romans 16. People say I'm non-denominational or something like that. And if you dub yourself that way, then you're not a genuine Christian. You're not a real Christian. You might say, why? Because a real Christian clarifies their distinct yep. beliefs, yep, that's right. what distinguishes them from other Christians. But no, you live in a world where, hey, let's not criticize other churches, other pastors. Why can't we all get along? We're all one. But look at Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16 and verse 17. Romans 16, 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and get along with them. Is that what it said? Nope. No, it says what? Avoid, Avoid them. Yeah. Notice here that you have to mark those by their what? Doctrines that teach differently from our doc doctrine. So it's important important that what you're going to see right here, I'm going to mark out doctrines and point out doctrines right here. And we have to mark them down and find which ones to avoid. You might say, why is that? Because there is a thing called doctrines of devils. Excuse me. Look at 1 Timothy 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Don't you know there's a thing called doctrines of devils? That's why God wants us to mark down on, what, on which doctrines are right and which ones you should distinguish, separate yourself from. All right, we're going to look at the book of uh, 1 Timothy and we'll look at chapter 4, chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. The Bible says right here in verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith. Look at this. So God recognizes these people as not really being genuine of the Christian faith here. They're not of the genuine Christian faith. And that's found at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, Giving heed to seducing spirits and what? Doctrines of devils. So notice right here that there is 
such a thing as wrong doctrine, right doctrine. And God distinguishes as my doctrine, God's doctrines, or the devil's doctrines. Okay, if you're not following God's doctrines, whose doctrines are you following? That's right, yeah. It's good. Remember, who's the one in control of the world? One. Mm -hmm. And who's the one who has his own doctrines? Two. Satan. So whether you believe it or not, when you look at this study right here, the study of all studies, the book that you're holding in your hand, the Bible, the Word of God, it points out right here that there is such a thing as people who can believe in wrong doctrines, and those are the people who actually embrace devils then. Okay, now that we've seen from these passages, we have, to write, we have to mark down the doctrine, right? And then we have to find out those doctrinal beliefs. Now, where I am at is uh, we, uh, I am a Bible-believing Christian. The doctrines that I believe are the King James Bible is the only perfect, pure word of God, and that you have to rightly divide the word of truth and dispensationalism. If you mainly have those two things, you pretty much get your 99% of doctrines down straight. So let's just stick with those two things, yeah. shall we? Yeah. If we stick to those two, to those two things, genuinely you, generally you get it right. And then obviously you have to find then the church group, the best church group that's closest to those doctrines. Yes. The best church group and denomination you're going to find is actually independent Baptists. All the other denominations that you find, you're not going to really find that. Right. Or practically zero, I would dare say. So that's the reason why I am an independent Baptist by denomination. Yeah. Because of those right doctrines, King James onlyism and dispensationalism. Now, if we, uh, now I have to prove those things. We have to look at these doctrines. See if these doctrines are genuinely of God. And I'm going to also prove at the same time that if you're not of those doctrines, you're genuinely of the devil. Believe it or not. And that's why you're going to find out that two billion Christians who don't agree with this doctrine, they embrace devils. Because the denomination that I'm at is smaller than you think. If we're going to say that it's over two billion Christians, look at the percentage right here. Uh, the percentage that they say, if it's over uh, 2 billion, they say 2.18 billion Christians. That's what they say at the year 2010, okay? So 2010. Now, you should know by now it's going to be a much larger number, right? It's going to be a much larger number now. 2010 is 2.18 billion so-called Christians. If it's 2.18 billion, then scratch this off and just say 2 billion. This is going to be uh, somewhere in the millions, right? Okay. So, is it safe to say that this number, 2 billion, is correct? Yes, because we're going to look at the largest Baptist denomination. And it's not the independent Baptists. They're actually this, probably the smallest or one of the smallest. The Southern Baptist Convention is probably uh, the largest. Uh, it is actually the world's largest Baptist denomination. And believe it or not, it can even be the largest Protestant, if not the second largest Christian denomination. But what they put up right here is that the congregants number to 47,614,000 by 2021. And that's, by, uh, that's according to Wikipedia statistics here. But you can look at their official website, sbc.net, the Southern Baptist Convention. All right, 47 million, that's much smaller than this. You notice that right there? So being much smaller than that, it's safe to cross this out, and then if it's safe to cross this out, then this number, 2 billion, stands to reason. Right. All right? Somewhere in this number is the Southern Baptist. Mm -hmm. 
But this number is not the Southern Baptist right here then. And if that be the case, then it's safe to say that two billion who are not independent Baptists then, if they don't have the doctrines like I do, as an independent Baptist who believe in King James onlyism and dispensationalism, then uh, two billion of them are wrong. And if two billion of them are wrong in their doctrine compared to my doctrine where I'm at as an independent Baptist, King James only dispensationalism, if my doctrine is of God, then their doctrine is not of God. Right. Then their doctrine is of yep. the devil. Yep. And then if that's the case, then they embrace Satan instead. Yep. Now, don't look at me like a tree full of owls. All you have to do is just look at those verses, study again, see if that makes sense. Amen. See if it's reasonable. I'm putting this as a safe number. <laughs> yeah. Safe number. But it's more than that. You know why? Because independent Baptists, you're going to find out, there's a huge number of them that are not King James only and dispensational. Yeah, right. So that makes it even smaller. Right. Wow, then that means over 2 billion, yeah. if not almost this full number right here, will embrace devils. Yeah. And then the churches that you go to then, that are Christian churches, will embrace devils. Yep. But, you know, let's not just give a statement and you think that that's just a rash accusation. Who do you think you are? Let's go by the studies here. How do we do it? We have to mark the doctrines, right? Mm -hmm. We have to mark the doctrines, find which one is of God, which one is of the devil. Okay, Amen. then let's do that. First of all, we're going to look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And then your second hand to go to 1 John 3. 1 John 3. 2 Timothy 2 and 1 John 3. Great teaching. Yeah. 2 Timothy 2 and 1 John chapter 4. Excuse me, chapter 4. All right? 1 John 4 and 2 Timothy chapter 2. Now, for some people... Uh, who heard me say dispensationalism, King James onlyism? What does that mean? Okay, so first of all, let's talk about uh, each one doctrine at a time. Uh, dispensationalism, what we believe is when you have that book in your hand, the Bible, you have to rightly divide the Bible. Right. You have to rightly divide the verses in there because the reason why is you can't just apply all those verses to yourself. You're going to hear people talking about well, you know, there's a verse that talks about losing your salvation. Well, are you rightly dividing that verse to yourself? Yeah. Yeah. How do you not know that verse is divided, yep. applied for a different group of people, yeah. different time period? Yep. For some people who are unaware of dispensationalism, please, uh, you can look at uh, our channel and then you'll notice our playlist. And in the playlist section, you'll find dispensationalism. If you click on that one, then you're going to find all that you need to know. You're going to find all that you need to know over there, dispensationalism. It'll give all the answers. So we believe that there are verses that can apply to different group of people, different time periods, because some of those verses may not apply to you. For example, the verse says that if you take God's name in vain, you should be stoned to death. If you break the Sabbath day, you should be stoned to death. Now, obviously, nobody practices that today. Right. We don't do capital punishment by stoning people to death. Now, let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. So you got an idea of what dispensationalism is. The verse is, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So notice right here, we are to rightly divide the Word of God. That's how we are supposed to study. Now, when we rightly divide it, the verse says right here, the Word of what? Truth. truth. So that is supposed to be truth right here. You'll notice this half line. Half line here, truth. Half line here, error. Notice right here that dispensationalism, or aka rightly dividing, according to 2 Timothy 2.15, that is of the truth. 
Now, what does the Bible say about truth and error? That there is a spirit behind it, an unclean spirit and a clean spirit, a demonic spirit and the Holy Spirit behind it. Look at 1 John chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, notice at verse 6. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth. Didn't just say truth. There's a spirit behind it. Spirit of truth and the spirit of what? Error. Error. Okay, is dispensationalism of the spirit of truth? Yes. Okay. Then if you're not dispensational, yep, come on. then you're not of the spirit of truth, correct? Correct. correct. Yep. Then what spirit are you of then if you're not dispensational? Come on, brother. Spirit of error. You have a demonic yeah. spirit. Yep. Hence are these other beliefs you'll find right here. Anti, they'll call it anti-dispensational because there's not really a term for that. Or mainly, if you are a theologian, they'll put themselves in the party mainly of covenant theology. And covenant theology is actually from the Reformed Church mainly. It's mainly composed of Calvinists, yeah. believe it or not. They do not believe in dispensationalism. Then you got to realize that Calvinist camp, or if a person is not a Calvinist but disagrees with dispensationalism, they have a demonic spirit. And that's not just a strong statement or something that's arrogant on my part or being mean. Look at the scripture. Yeah. Have your beef with scripture. People get upset at me for some weird reason when I'm just stating something that you should see from the scripture yourself. Amen. They refuse to study the verse, yeah. to follow the logic. People have lost their reason nowadays, yeah. their, their logic. They go by feelings. Is that what you're doing right now? See, going by feelings. And that's very dangerous if you go by feelings. Okay, understanding that, then we know that dispensationalism is of truth. If you don't believe in dispensationalism, and any of you watching online don't believe in dispensationalism, or this is the first time you've heard, or you've got concerns or questions, or even criticisms, you know, why don't you look, study? Don't just go by feelings, study. And, oh, well, I've studied. Studied what? Did you study the Word of God or did you study stuff that you went through online yourself? Right. You got to study the Word of God. Look at our playlist. We'll give you too many scriptures. We'll make you study the Word of God. If, I don't, uh, if I'm not doing my job, then you can ask any of my people, okay? But we make sure we go through scripture. Amen. Heavy scripture on that one. And you got to look at it yourself. And don't look at me like a tree full of owls. Look at the verse and see if my explanation lines up with that verse. Amen. Another one is John 16. Mm -hmm. Keep your hand here. All right, keep your hand here. Now go to John 16. John 16. What's popular nowadays is People are saying that morals are relative, yeah. that uh, there's no such thing as absolutes, that you can't really tell uh, what is true or what is lie. There are gray areas. And let's be honest, we don't know. And that's why agnosticism is a very popular belief, agnosticism. But I want you to open your Bibles to the book of John 16. Let's see what God says about that. The Bible says in John 16, 13, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, will come, uh, is come, he will guide you into what? Did it say some truth or all truth? Oh. All truth. Okay, so notice right here that there has to be absolutes right here. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. All right then if you're going to be of the Holy Spirit, you have to believe that God himself can give you all truth. If you believe there's no such thing as a standard where you can get all truth, that's not of the Holy Spirit then. John 16, 13 says, no, the Spirit guides you into all truth. God insists that he's the standard of all truth. Okay, if you 
Uh, if you're not for that spirit then, then what spirit are you of? Right. Again, the devil. Relativism yeah. is of the devil. Hey, right, bro. Moral relativity is satanic. Now, look at uh, 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. People can only believe in natural tendencies. That's why there's a thing called naturalism. That's why they make science as their god and their idol. Why? Because they have to observe the natural workings of the universe, and that's the only thing that they can believe. If that's your case, notice what the Bible says. At verse 14, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Yeah. Well, obviously, you can't put the Holy Spirit in a test tube. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, that's why we can't prove the Holy Spirit through scientific means. No, you can't use natural workings of the universe, those means to prove the Holy Spirit. You have to use other means right. to prove the Holy Spirit. In this case, the Bible says spiritually discerned. So then... If naturalism is not of the Holy Spirit, then, then what is it of? Mm -hmm. The majority of the scientific community trumps naturalism, etc. What spirit are they of then? If, not of, if the Holy Spirit's not in there. And who's in charge of the natural world anyways nowadays? Yeah. Remember, who's the God of this natural world? Yep. Or did you forget? Satan. Okay, anyways... I know you hate that word, all right? Whenever I say Satan, everyone just freezes or their feelings pent up and they get upset and they go, ah! <laughs> okay, but uh, your beef is not with me. Your beef is with the word of God. Yeah. John 14, 6. John 14, 6. You know, to have these uh, Christian beliefs and the way that you argue, and then you give all these kinds of religious opinions and your doctrines and etc. They all uh, talk in that manner to talk down on you. That's very narrow-minded. It's bigoted. It's not, it's not uh, your knowledge is not vast enough. You're not being open-minded so that you can study all the different beliefs out there and then you could find out that somewhere they've, uh, they're all uh, they're all onto something in together, and even though they're all different, you know, no, that's not the case. Look at uh, John fourteen verse six. Jesus saith unto them, "I am the way and what, the truth and the life." Look at this: No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Is that what the verse said? That's what the verse said. Jesus said he is the only way. Right. Yep. He is the truth. The light. He is the only way, the only truth. Yeah. No other means of truth, no other way. Right. Yeah. He is the truth. You, now, that's narrow-minded, bigoted? No. Truth. That's truth. That's Jesus Christ is truth. Yeah. Okay. Then what spirit are you of if you don't believe in that narrow-minded yeah. Christian belief or whatever? That's right, brother. You're of the devil. Yep, man. All right. Yep. Next, uh... Man, we have a lot of smiling faces today, don't yeah. we? <laughs> Let's look at Revelation 2. Revelation chapter 2. Good stuff. Yeah. Revelation chapter 2. What are you doing? I'm marking doctrines for you. Right. You know why? You're not marking doctrines. Mm -hmm. You just uh, hear something in a church, watch something online that suits your taste. Yes, and whatever suits your taste... That must be right for you. That's real good. No, that's, uh, then you're not marking doctrines. You're going by what you want to hear. Uh, let's go back to Romans 16. Keep your hand in Revelation 2. Let's go back to Romans 16. Remember Romans 16? Or did you forget? Romans 16 was that verse about marking doctrines, right? Okay, if you don't mark doctrines, and you're the type that instead wants to hear something that suits your taste, suits your flesh, your preference, look what the Bible says. 
Romans 16, 17 again. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. Okay, you're not doing that, then what are you? Is this you? Verse 18, for they that are su such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, Whoa. and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Yeah. Is that you? Yeah, yeah, you're going by your suitable preferences, your own tastes, right? Yeah, your own tastes. That's why the Bible says your own belly. Yeah. You're going by your own taste, bud. Yeah. People just don't pay attention to the verses nowadays. Right. All right, look at Revelation 2. Revelation 2. Revelation chapter 2. Are you part of those 2 billion Christians who embrace devils? Come on, brother. That's something important to think about, especially if you never heard some of these doctrines because you never marked the doctrines. Wow, now's the time you better start studying your doctrine. Yes, sir. That way you, don't, you can stop embracing devils. All right, Revelation chapter 2. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 2, and notice at verse 13, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, right? Mm -hmm. Satan has his own seat. Look at Revelation 2, 9. 2, 9. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Now, Revelation 2.9 has been used for anti-Semites to teach that the Jewish nation, that the nation of Israel, they're no longer God's chosen people. They'll teach that the Christian church or they themselves who are the real Christian or whatever are the real Jews themselves. And that the Jews are the synagogue of Satan because it says synagogue right here. So then they must be of Satan. Now, they got several issues right here. Uh, the problem with that teaching, which is called replacement theology, it's been popular among conspiracy theorists as well. Yeah. Because it's uh, very, uh, you can find easily a lot of Jewish elites, okay? And if you find a lot of Jewish elites, that's why they become anti-Semite. That's why they deny the current nation of Israel that the Lord can restore them and use that nation again. Because they see so much, uh, they see so much wickedness and the rise of liberalism and everything in the nation of Israel. But the answer to those things is simply this, is that it doesn't matter which people God would choose to be his own people. Guess what? Don't you think that the devil can attack those people and make them apostatize? Right. Christians are God's people, right? If you insist Christians are God's chosen people, look at the majority of Christians nowadays. Yeah, yeah. You don't think that uh, they're wicked? <laughs> oh, they're nice people, right? They're all wonderful people, right? Or do they sin? Uh, you think you're better? How's your Christian walk with Jesus Christ? Right. Yep. Did you read your Bible yesterday and pray or did you skip it again? Is your conversation clean? Your thought life clean? Come on, man. Who are you kidding me? Yeah. Don't kid me, man. So that's a weak... Uh, if you have that kind of feeling and emotion of uh, being upset because how evil they are, hey, man, hey, man, uh, look at the mirror. Yeah. Look at the mirror. That's right. All right? There are a bunch of Christian churches who apostatize as well yeah. and used by the devil. So that don't, uh, that don't mean anything, all right? Whatever people, uh, when God chose the kingdom of Israel at the Old Testament, didn't they have a lot of wickedness rising? <laughs> they sure did. When God took the Jews outside of the nation of Egypt and delivered them and said, these are my people, wasn't there a lot of wickedness going on? Come on. It's just common sense. Okay, then. Believe it or not, Revelation 2.9 is actually referring to those people. It's referring to people who are claiming themselves to be real Jews. Now, why do they have to say, here's something interesting. For people who accuse the Jews that they are fake Jews, but I'm a real Jew, why do you say real Jew? Why can't you just say Jew? Why do you say I'm a real, real Jew? 
See, it's something like you want to make yourself a Jew, right? Then isn't this talking, Revelation 2, 9, talking about you then, not those Jews, which say they are Jews and are not. Right? Why do they have to say that? But uh, let's, say, let's look at this. Let's look at Romans 9, Romans 9. Uh, Romans 11, let's look at Romans 11. Romans chapter 11. The Bible says, which say they are Jews and are not. Correct? Okay, which say that they are Jews and are not. Then look at Romans chapter 11. If God says that the, those Jews, by ethnicity, those physical Jews... I'm not talking about spiritual Jews, real Jews, or, you know, the Christians who replace the Jews, whatever. No. Physical ethnicity, physical flesh are Jews. If God says those are Jews, then are they Jews? Yes, they're Jews, if God says so. They aren't the Jews who say they are Jews and are not. Okay, look at Romans 11, verse 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite, of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Do you see that? Okay, look at Romans. Keep your hand here. Keep your hand here. Go to Romans 9. Romans 9. Verse 3. Romans 9, verse 3. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, what? According to the flesh, physical flesh, who are what? Israelites. How about that? So physical Jews by ethnicity in the flesh, God says they're Jews. Yeah. If they're Jews, then guess what? They're Jews. Yep. Okay. Then those guys who accuse those physical Jews, no, you're not really Jews. I'm a real Jews. Then is Revelation 2.9 talking about those guys being the synagogue of Satan? Yep. Yes, it's those guys. So... If they're anti-Semite in doctrine and claim that they're Jews but they're not, then who are they embracing? God or the devil? Whose doctrine are they of? God or the devil? The devil. They embrace Satan. Replacement theology then is of the devil. Replacement theology is of the devil. They embrace demons. Be careful of that kind of stuff. Be careful of that kind of stuff. It's easy to dig into evil uh, with people you don't like yeah. rather than with people you do like. Right. Yep. And the people we tend to like the most is ourselves. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yep. Here's another one. We're going to uh, look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and Revelation 2 and 1 John 3. All right, let me repeat those three verses again. Uh, but I wrote them down here, 2 Thessalonians 2, Revelation 2, and then uh, 1 John 4, excuse me, I keep saying 3, 1 John 4. So we're going to look at three passages. Now, uh, you hear from people nowadays talking about uh, signs and wonders. Like, I believe that I can go to church and then somebody can put his hands on me and I can be healed. Now, listen up now, I do believe in miracles. And I believe in the power of prayer where God can answer prayer mightily and he can heal people. I believe in that. But I don't believe a person laying his hand on you and then saying, I, I heal you in the name of Jesus Christ. I don't believe in that. Those, those are called signs. Those are called signs. We don't believe in those healing signs anymore. I believe that those things are God. Now, you might say, no, that's not true. Uh, uh, those things are still ongoing. No, they're gone. Because uh, one is dispensationalism. If you know your doctrine of dispensationalism, it teaches that those signs were originally for the Jewish people. Yep. It was originally for the Jewish nation. But because the Jewish nation rejected God, God switched from Jew to Gentile. When he switched from Jew to Gentile, hence there is no longer a need to continue the healing signs. Right. That's what you have to realize. So I would recommend looking at our videos on dispensationalism for more details on that. 
But let me prove the easiest why I don't believe signs are ongoing today. Okay? If you think that signs are ongoing today, then uh, why isn't this uh, COVID situation gone? Yeah, for real. For these guys who yeah. claim that, you know, they can cure a person, yeah. you know, of uh, eye disease yeah. or back problems and stuff like that, they, yeah. sure, they, they sure can't banish COVID, can yeah. they? And by the way, you can watch these videos, like the, one of the most famous ones is Ken, Kenneth okay. Copeland saying, I adjure you, COVID, in the name of Jesus, go away, get out. Oh, yeah, worse. The Victory Channel, uh, I think that's what they call themselves in YouTube. Huge number of followers, unbelievable. They had that guy, Hank uh, something, uh, I forgot that guy's name, but that guy, he was praying away the COVID situation and stuff like that too. Well, guess what? Some good that it did. Yeah. Oh, let me add to this, okay? If, if you don't believe in the pandemic thing, then g pray away the flu. Yeah. All right, pray away the flu, man, okay? Uh, why can't they do that? Why can't they do that? Isn't the signs and wonders so miraculous that they cured leprosy and raised dead people back to life? Yeah. Come on, man. A flu is too tough for our mighty Lord. How about that? Yeah, the hospital. Yeah. Okay. If you believe signs and wonders are still ongoing, I have a right to test you yeah. Yeah. They don't like that. and to tell you, then cure me of this. Yeah. And if you can't cure me of that, then guess what? then you're proven to be of the wrong spirit, the spirit of the devil. Yep. Now, you might say, Ooh, th that's very strong. No. Look at 1 John 4 again. All right, one by one. 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, the Bible says right here, at verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but what? Try the spirits, whether they are of God. You have to test the spirit because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Yep. Because of false ministers out there, false religious people out there, religious leaders out there, God says you're supposed to test them. Right. And that includes those healing signs. Look at Revelation 2. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. The apostles, they had the signs of an apostle, right? Healing, raising the dead, curing diseases. You know what the Bible says? You're supposed to try them, test them, if they have those signs of the apostles. They're also called apostolic signs. Apostolic signs. So those healing signs and everything are also called apostolic signs. Why? Because the apostles did it. Look at Revelation 2, verse 2. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them what? Liars. Liars. The Bible says you're supposed to try out those people who claim to have the apostolic signs. Same thing that those apostles did. No, then uh, Revelation 2, 2, you're supposed to try them out. That's what God tells you to do. You have to try them out. Revelation 2, 2. He commends you to do that. Right. All right. And if you prove them to be a liar, what spirit are they of, according to 1 John 4? The devil. Yep. Because you have to try the spirit. And 2 Thessalonians 2 is even worse. Yeah. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. You know who's all for those signs and wonders movement? The Antichrist, Satan. Yep. You know that? Yep. He's all, all right. for that. See, it shows where this spirit is pointing toward. It's a demonic spirit. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. <clears throat> and we're going to look at verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Jesus or Satan? Satan. Satan. With all power and what? Signs and lying wonders. How about that? All right, don't get mad at me. Get mad at the book. Yeah. All right, look at 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14. Then you're telling me that those speaking in tongues, that's of the devil. Hey, you're absolutely right. You're getting on to something. Yep. I'm glad you're thinking. Or were you actually getting upset and just accusing me, you know? Yeah, come on. 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Let's look at this again, okay? 
1 Corinthians chapter 14. Now let's see if you follow these rules in speaking in tongues, okay? Speaking in tongues, what do they do? Verse 23. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues. That's what you see in those churches, right? You know, Bethel and those guys. Yep. Everyone speaking in tongues. Mm -hmm. And there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers. Will they not say that ye are what? Mad. Mad. See, God condemns that. God condemns that. Here's another one, verse 27. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most by three. Look at that. It doesn't go more than two or three people for speaking in tongues. But the speaking in tongues is also something you can interpret. Okay? When people talk about an interpreter, all right, especially when they do language translations, don't they call those people's interpreters? Okay. If Keep reading right here at verse 27. And that by course, and let one what? Interpret. Oh, wait a minute. Then this speaking in tongue is not what you think from those churches to be some kind of divine thing like those signs and wonders God puts on you and then you just speak blah, 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 you know, like that. Like it's some heavenly, mysterious language. No, it's a tongue simply means a different language. Tongue means it's simply a different language because you can interpret it. If you don't think so, then why, how are you going to deny scores of verses in your Bible that talks about, let every nation, kindred, and tongue? Why does it say it that way? It's talking about different nationalities, different nations, different languages. See that? So speaking in tongues means speaking in different nationalities, different uh, different languages, different right. languages. Right. Okay, so do you see that in those churches? No, you don't see that. Okay, now what does God say right here? You're going to notice that at verse, at 1 Corinthians 14, 33, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. Okay, look at that right here. If it shows that... Uh, if you don't follow these rules on how to speak in different languages, then that's confusing, right? And the Bible says God is not the author of that confusion, right? Okay, then if he's not, then who is the author yeah. Yeah. of that confusion? Yep. You don't like that word again. It's called Satan. Yeah. <laughs> it's called Satan. He's the author of confusion. So we see speaking of tongues right here. That's a sign of something demonic. Mm -hmm. The Bible says author of confusion, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, then. What's this? Modern Bible versions. Why did you put that there, Pastor? Because when you have 200 plus different Bibles out there, that's confusing. Yeah. Yep, that's right. You know what the, the saying is? Well, they all, uh, they don't say the same thing, but they all mean the same thing. No, they all don't mean the same thing, friend. Look at our playlist, uh, Defending the King James Bible, Defending the KJV, and you're going to find out tons of videos that, no, the, the verses are actually very confusing. Right. All right, but let's look at a few examples, shall we? Let's look at a few examples. Uh, let's look at the book of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel. Let's look at the book of 2 Samuel. And then I want you to go to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. Second Samuel 21. 2 Samuel 21. And John chapter 7. Now, see, don't tell me that uh, in this church I don't go to the Bible to search yeah. for truth, yeah. okay? Come on. I'm giving you so many verses that you're probably thinking, why is he going to too many verses? So don't give me that accusation. He don't go to the Bible for truth. Uh, you're funny, okay? Yeah. Go to 2 Samuel chapter 21. And then we're going to look at John chapter 7. John chapter 7. Now, simple question, okay? Who killed Goliath? Yeah, yeah. It's not a trick question. Who killed Goliath? It's uh, David, right? Yeah. 
<laughs> Who said that? <laughs> so we know it's David, right? Right. All right, now look at 2 Samuel chapter 21. What if I told you that, no, it's not David, it's actually Elhanan killed Goliath. You might think, you just made that up, didn't you? No, I didn't make it up. That's a word. <laughs> That's a word. I kid you not. All right, look at 2 Samuel 21, verse 19. And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines where Elhanan, the son of Jero, uh, Jeriroregim, a Bethlehemite, slew Goliath the Gittite. Did I read that right? No. Elhanan slew who what? The brother of Goliath the Gittite. But guess what? In, if you look at your modern Bible versions, they, say the bro, uh, they actually say Elhanan killed Goliath. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Wow. How about that? Now, look, look at John 7. John 7. Look what they did. Uh, they made God a liar. Yeah, they sure did. Yeah. They lied. Yeah. I mean, isn't it a lie? Isn't it not true? If you say, Elhanan killed Goliath when actually David killed <laughs> Goliath? It's called a lie, yeah. isn't it? Right. Yeah. It's called a lie, Amen. okay? Well, it's just a, no, no, it's called a lie, okay? Amen. Look at John chapter 7. If it's not true, all right? If you don't think so, then look up the definition of a word lie is in all dictionaries, okay? You need to go back to preschool. Yeah, for real. Five-year-olds know what lying means better than you grown adults. Uh, excuse me, not grown adults, PhD scholars. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there you go. All right, John chapter 7. John chapter 7. Verse 6, John chapter 7, verse 6. Then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. Verse 8, Go ye up into this feast. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. Okay, so Jesus says, I'm not yet going to this feast, uh -huh. right? Why? Because he later goes. Notice, at verse 9 and 10, when he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee, but when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. So notice right here, Jesus said, I'm not yet going to the feast. Why? Because he later went to the feast at verse 9 and 10. So I'm not going now, I'm going to go later. All right. You know what your modern Bible version said? Your modern Bible version says that Jesus, they dropped the word yet at verse 8. And then Jesus says, I'm not going to the feast. I go not to the feast. Why? Jesus, no. Jesus lied. Verse 10, he did go to the feast later on. The modern Bible versions made Jesus a liar. Made Jesus a liar. But let's look at Mark 1. Look at Mark 1. Mark 1. Now, look, isn't that confusing then? That's confusing. If you don't think that's confusing, you teach in Sunday school class to one group, Elhanan killed Goliath, and then another group of kids, David killed Goliath. Let's see when you have a quiz game after that, who killed Goliath? Elhanan, David, and then... They're going to look at each other like it's funny and weird and it's confusing. And only the PhD teacher, the dummy, is going to say, both of you are correct. Just like your public school teacher says, both of you are correct. There's no right and wrong. Both of you are correct. Morals, there's no absolute. See these Christian churches harping, championing about absolutes. They're not absolute in their Bible. The very word of God that they hold in their hand, you don't put an absolute on it. Wow, I'd be scared to death if I were you. Yeah. All right, Mark 1. Now, this passage, majority of modern Bible versions make the mistake, actually. Mark chapter 1 and verse 2 and 3. Verse 2 and 3. The Bible says, As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. So notice... Verse 2 says, as it is written in where? Prophets. All right. So more than one prophet is speaking. 
Verse 2 is quoted by Malachi, okay? Verse 3 is Isaiah. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Okay, so let me repeat again. So the Bible says that more than one prophet, two prophets are speaking here. Verse 2 is Malachi in Malachi chapter 3. <clears throat> and then verse 3 of Mark chapter 1, that's Isaiah speaking at Isaiah chapter 40. Well, guess what? Uh, in the modern Bible versions, it says at Mark chapter 1 verse 2, as it is written in the prophets. No, they say as it is written in Isaiah. Or they'll say Isaiah said. And majority of modern Bible versions will say that. If you don't believe me, look it up. Why? They made the scriptures lie too. Yeah, they did. Because they, as it is written in the prophets, the, the author Mark has to prove it with scripture. So he's quoting from scripture, the prophets. Yeah. But they even made that scriptural reference, his scriptural proof, a lie. So they made Jesus lie. They made the scriptures itself a lie, yeah. and they themselves are inconsistent in their basic Sunday school teaching lesson about David killing Goliath a lie. Okay, that's confusing. Who's the author? God's certainly not the author of those books then, right? right. Of those Bibles? And who's the author of those Bibles, of that confusion? Yeah. Yeah. You don't like saying the word. I'll say it for you again. Yeah. Satan. All right. Wow, what a cuss word nowadays, yeah. All right, here's another one. Go to John 8, John 8, John chapter 8. That's why you got to be King James only. But here's another reason why you should be King James only, and this should uh, disturb you a bit. This should disturb you. The reason why you should be King James only is, who is the father of lies? Wow, who's the father of lies? I mean, if those verses, and we've seen those verses that they lied, right? In the modern Bible versions? Yep. All right. Did they lie? Yes. If they told a lie, who's the father of those lies? Who's the spirit that led them when they did those translation works in the modern Bible versions? Yeah. Look at John chapter 8, verse 44. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. See, the devil is the father of lies. Okay, now I think that I've uh, shown you enough. I've shown you enough that if you're not King James only, if you're not dispensational, and that's very dangerous. And that uh, you're probably embracing the doctrine of devils then. Right, man. right. Now, two billion of those other denominations, when you look at their doctrines, they don't believe in those doctrines that we teach. About the King James Bible is the only Bible you should use, and it's perfect. And that we believe in dispensational doctrines. If they don't teach or they don't believe in that... Wow, then what spirit are they of? Who are they embracing, those yeah. two billion Christians? Right. The devil. Yeah. All right. Now, I didn't show you a lot of other things, but I think that's more than enough and because time is up. But I can summarize quickly and briefly for you yeah, over yeah, here. All right, in case you want to know. First John chapter 4, if you go back over there, the Bible says about the spirit of Antichrist. All right, who has the spirit of Antichrist? Those who don't say Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. In other words, that uh, Jesus Christ already came down in the flesh, in the body before. Now, you and I believe that God is, Jesus Christ is God, and a long time ago, he did come down into this world in the flesh, right? Yes. All right. Yes. The Roman Catholic Mass don't teach that. What they teach is Jesus Christ keeps coming down in the flesh for you. It's not in the past. It's still going on right now. Why? Because when you take in the Mass or their Eucharist, this is the literal flesh of Jesus you're eating. 
So they deny that Jesus Christ came in the past tense in the flesh. He only came down one time and it was in the past. They deny that one. They say, no, he's still here right now in the flesh where you can eat him. You know what the Bible says of 1 John 4? That's the spirit of Antichrist. Right. So the Eucharist, the Roman Catholic Mass, is of the devil. Yeah. Here's another one. People talk about that. I saw Jesus. I saw Jesus. You know, I got a vision. I saw in a dream Jesus and etc. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, the Bible warns about another Jesus and no marvel Satan can transform himself into an angel of light. See, how do you really know that that's not Satan you're seeing who transformed himself into some kind of angelic being, right. another Jesus? Right. So you got to be careful of that. How do you know that those things are gone? Because if you look at Revelation, uh, I would recommend for you to uh, just uh, look at our videos on dispensationalism. It'll explain about visions. Mm -hmm. But uh, long story short, if you compare that with uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Vision is part of Revelation. And Revelation chapter 1 says that the book of Revelation itself will discuss about things to come, what they see about God's revelation that will show all the things to come. And then Revelation says at Revelation 22, don't add to that after that. So don't add to the revelation in the book of Revelation. So if people claim, oh, I had a revelation, what are they doing? They're adding another revelation besides the book of Revelation. But you can watch that video. I, again, I have to summarize because my time is up, okay? So I don't have time to persuade you convincingly and go slow. And there's a bunch of angry onliners commenting yeah. and being so rash because I didn't go step by step like a baby feeding them, showing them persuasively. That's yeah. why. So just study, look at the verses, and look at that playlist like I told you. Another one is another gospel. This is the most important one, perhaps. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 says, Satan can use another gospel. Yeah. All right. When people tell you that, um, you know, how, this is how you get saved, water baptism. This is how you get saved is uh, repenting of all your sin. Make sure you stop sinning. Uh, uh, make sure that you do a lot of good works as a Christian. I need to see fruit out of your life because if I don't see it, then uh, you're not really saved. And all that kind of stuff, then you know what that is? That is a wrong gospel. That is not the salvation gospel. Right. People will argue about if you really have salvation by faith alone, works will manifest and show. And they'll use James 2 and a lot of other verses that shows their lack of dispensationalism. Yeah. And again, watch that playlist, please. That video will show that those verses apply to different groups of people, different time periods. Yep. The Bible shows that Romans 4, 11, Galatians 2... And 2 Corinthians, uh, at, at those passages, that the Bible says that grace and works are completely separated. If you put work within the grace, then you automatically cancel grace, actually. Yeah, yeah. And the Bible also shows that, Romans 4, that if you didn't do a single work but just believe, you're automatically counted as righteous. Yeah. And Galatians 2 gives a simple question. If you think that uh, good works can save you, then why did Jesus even bother dying for you? Right. So his death counted for everything. All right, that's more than enough. Uh, you should be convinced by now that more, than, that more than 2 billion Christians embrace devils. Yeah. Are you one of them? I hope that one of you are watching. Don't just stop right here, that you will study the playlist KJV, Defending the KJV and Dispensationalism uh, from our channel. Heavenly Father, I pray that today's teaching has been eye-opening to the people, has made them see that this is truly a doctrine of devils and that two billion Christians, sadly, who are not even real Christians, that they have embraced devils and demons. And I pray that uh, the people here won't fall into that trap as well and that we'll stand for right doctrine, we'll study right doctrine this time and grow in truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. amen.